Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephen Sapel, Legal Ordained Reverend, Youth Life Church, a chaplain of church, a priest for church, I'm also a preceptor of church, I'm a preacher of church, I'm also a father, a padre, honorary Bible historian. I'm, of course, a uh, ordained minister with uh, Universal Ministries. I have an honorary doctorate in ministry, metaphysics, divinity, humanitarianism. And of course, a stated ministry. And of course, I'm also a Lord Knight of the First Order of the Holy Order of Saints. Now that I got that out of the way, let's begin this January 19th uh, live streamed uh, street preach sermon. So I'm going to open this up with a reading from sacraments. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, Luke chapter 7, verses 19 through 23. The healing hand of Christ is a sign of the presence of God. That same hand is extended to us in this sacrament now to console and strengthen us. Summoning two of his disciples, John said to them to ask the Lord, Are you he is to come, or are I to expect someone else? When the man came to him, they said, John the baptizer sends us to you with this question, Are you he is to come, or do we look for someone else? At the time, he was curing many of their diseases, afflictions, and evil spirits. He had also restored sight to many who are blind. Jesus gave this response, Go report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind recover their strength, cripples walk, lepers are cured, and the deaf hear. Dead men are raised to life, the poor have the good news preached to them. Blessed is the man that finds no stumbling block in me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. So I'm going to continue opening this with a couple of prayers. Father, we use your Son's cross as a sign of victory in life. May, those, may all who share this suffering find these sacraments a source of fresh courage and healing. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. God of compassion, you take every family under your care and know that our physical and spiritual needs. Transform our weakness by the strength of your grace and conform in us in your covenant so that we may grow faith and love. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. So today's Street Preach Sermon's title is Understanding the Limitation that Jesus Christ has placed on us. With everything that's currently going on right now, with the ongoing Israel-Gaza conflict, that genocidal war, I should say, with, of course, the ongoing Ukraine war, with all these conflicts going on and here in the United States, with the rising hatred, especially concerning the idolaters and everything else that is Antichrist, open rebellion against God, the hatred, and desiring to destroy those who are your enemies instead of following Jesus' command to love your enemies. And so, in the sermon today, I will be talking specifically on these topics. So I'm going to first open up this sermon with a reading, sacramental reading. I was going to do a scripture reading, but you know what? I'm just going to do that sacramental reading specifically. God is our refuge, and this is from uh, Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3, 7, and 10 through 11. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried to the midst of the sea, though the waters therefore roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Salah. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Salah. And this passage from Psalm 46, exorcists use this as procedural prayers to gain strength in the Holy Spirit. And I definitely do use this when I do minor exorcism or necessarily major. And 
today, earlier, before I actually started preaching the sermon, I did my uh, first uh, consecration of my community of the year. So, on this day for January 19th. And so with Psalm 46, again, the psalmist uh, states that God is going to be, be with you throughout anything and any conceivable thing that you would go through. That God is more powerful than the earth. God is more powerful than anything, the tsunamis and earthquakes, than every natural disaster or any disaster that could encompass and ensnare you. God is your refuge. Go to God when you need deliverance, and God will protect you. God will safeguard you. God will deliver you. You are his child. God loves you very, very, very much. And again, as previously stated, I, as a legally ordained reverend, I, as a young priest that I am, I, as one of the few exorcists in my rural community, I state for a fact that I rely on God's holy gift, that of God's Holy Spirit, specifically. I have to rely on God's Holy Spirit. I have to totally rely on Him. I have no power on my own, no ability on my own. I have to trust God when I'm put in situations that most humans should never be put into, I might add, and I have to deal with things that no other human should, and the safeguarding of human life, be it through dealing with the suicide location, or specifically the entity contained there and thereof that gives that compulsion for people to commit suicide in that location in my town, and having to go there and banish that entity, or whatever, that spirit of murder, specifically, and I have to deal with that every once in a while, certainly, because again, when it comes to consecrating areas, I will have to periodically uh, do a re-consecration because, again, people carry things. So places that are once consecrated will have to be re-consecrated. And then oppressive spirits will have to be pushed out. Like, for example, like the first uh, consecration of the year that I did, my day job, an oppressive spirit had infested the location and I had to banish it. And upon ban banishing it, all my co-workers that had been dealing with all this mess of emotions and everything else, all of them had improved. And of course they got numerous blessings. And persons uh, dealing with specific things or specifically under vexation subsequently were depowered. Again, the exorcist has no power on their own, of their own. It is a true reliance on God. To have empowerment, have discernment, and to banish things. So, continuing the sermon. And I'm going to be taking a reading of Luke chapter 16. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And in this part of scripture, Jesus himself is referring to the fact that if you want to serve God, you cannot have any other devotion except to God. You cannot devote yourself to God and anything. And of course, idolatry is defined loosely, the devotion to something or someone other than God, or God and something. And with the rapid rise of idolatry, especially some politics here in the United States, well, of course, that's been going on for decades, but with the Trump era and before and so on, with so many people 
that are selling their souls, literally, to have devotion to one human. And by doing so, they forsake God, they end up with spiritual evils as a subsequent res result. And that subsequent result is defined as diabolical obsession. And so before I get a little bit further into that, I will actually have that definition for you. Diabolical Obsession, and this is from uh, Father Gabriel Amaras, next to explain the Yvonne, the answer to Satan's army of fallen angels. Diabolical Obsession, Diabolical Obsessions are disturbances of extreme strong hallucinations that the demon imposes, often invisibly, on the mind of the victim. In these cases, a person is no longer a master of his own thoughts, rather he is subjected to a powerful force that creates mental activity in him that is repetitive, obsessive, and irresistible. So when it comes to idolatry, again, idolatry is loosely defined as devotion to someone or something other than God, or someone and something other than God, or God and something, or God and someone. So the, obsess the obsession of people for their Messiah figures, so Trump supporters with Trump, of course, so with Biden supporters with Biden. And yes, I'm going to throw both those names there. This is idolatry, pure and simple. And so no wonder they are, no wonder they are, so those who are consumed, dominated by the spirit of hatred, the type of demonic spirit that gives temptation, demonic suggestion to harm and kill others. And so these supporters of these, these political figures, their messiahs, their, well, false messiahs for that matter, they're obsessed with them, and they will follow their commands to do harm and kill in their name. And as we've seen, as we get to testify, and as we witness to them, of course, the January 6th insurrection, and of course, everything else that they will continuously do in support of their Messiah. They are hellbound for selling their soul. But it is not too late to pray for them that God heals their hearts, minds, bodies, souls, that they repent and that they atone. It's do your part to save their souls. As absolutely necessarily, if they are if you have a Trump supporter that is your relative, make certain that they get the help that they desperately need, the mental health help and the spiritual help, so they may have to be given major exorcism dispel the demon inside that they have received for their devotion to someone for the sin of idolatry and the crafts of idolatry their actions for their false god so continuing on this point of diabolical obsession Diabolical obsessions are disturbances or extremely strong hallucinations that the demon poses often visibly on the mind of the victim. In these cases, a person is no longer master of his own thoughts. Rather, he's subject to the powerful force that creates mental activity and that is repetitive, obsessive, and irresistible. Such representations of reality, even if foreign to his matter of thinking, become profoundly fixed in his psyche. So again, their obsession with their Messiah. We saw this with uh, the Nazis, with their fear, and this with Trump supporters of their messiah, of course. The objects of these hallucinations can be manifested in visions as voices or as rustlings. They can also appear as monstrous figures, horrifying animals or devils. In these other cases, it can be impulse to commit suicide or do evil to others. And that is very specific, to do evil to others, to kill in his name, 
to dominate and control others in his name, as these Christian nationalists desire to do. Again, Antichrist, open rebellion against God, for God is love. Those who are not of love are not of God. Again, no matter what they profess, they are diabolical in nature, giving into the demonic temptation, the demonic suggestion to kill others. So again, in other cases, they give me impulse to commit suicide or do evil to others. And particularly in the young, it can lead to confusion of other things. The history of the case is so vast that it is impossible to enumerate all the forms of diabolical obsession. So again, a reminder is, who can become obsessed, who can become possessed, anyone for that matter, Who becomes obsessed? People of every faith and none. The devil does not look in the face of anyone. No one can consider themselves excluded. They can be young or old, believers or atheists, Christians or those of other religions. In most cases, those who are distant from the faith are more susceptible to this risk. For this is all the indication, the maxim that says the devil is more tranquil if he does not have to live with prayer, fasting, the Eucharist, and other sacramental practices. I will also add that the demon does not particularly like to exercise extraordinary action. He prefers by far to act through temptation. In the first case, the external manifestation clearly unmasks resistance. In the second, hiding himself behind ignorance and sly faith. He can act more easily because he is undisturbed. The devil is content when no one believes in his existence or when people consider him solely a medieval relic then he can truly act tranquilly. So again, let's define temptation. Satan's mission is well explained by the Apostle Peter. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a war lion, seeking whom we want, seeking one to devour. First Peter chapter five verse eight. We can interpret that the devouring as doing harm, bringing to redemption. The devil's mission in the world is to seduce souls, leading each man and woman on the weary path of sin. The principal path of this tragic mission is a path to temptation. Each one of us must fight against temptation to sin, and for as long as we live, indeed, sin leads to death. It should surprise, not surprise anyone. I shall speak plainly for this. I say is more effective to say it's ordinary temptation action than it's extraordinary action. We are all victims of temptation. Well, at least some are victims of the extraordinary action of Satan, but never through their own fault. Therefore, they are not morally responsible. Temptation assaults us each holy day. Jesus himself submitted temptation during the 40 days he spent in the desert after his baptism in the Jordan. See Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, also later on. The devil tempts us both in our natural dimension, that is, in our interior wounds and weaknesses, and through the various occasions of sin that we represent that present themselves. Temptation is dangerous because it is difficult to uncover the fulls of our thoughts, words, works, and missions. Discernment is necessary, that is, we must have a well-trained eye and the spiritual intelligence that helps us to recognize the call of the tempter and those who bring us straight to sin. We must reject them and instead accept the good inspirations that come from God. Therefore, it is necessary to guard our heart and our external sense to from indecent, indecent spectacles. Each of us becomes what we see, what we listen to, and what we read. Therefore, let us be discerning what we see, what we listen to, and above all, let us choose good friends. It is also necessary to have a well-formed conscience. A good conscience is not achieved by elevating oneself, or worse yet, allowing the dominant culture to arbitrate good and bad. A good conscience is obtained by comforting one's will to God's will, and to his teachings which are given us our happiness, our salvation, or summer as highest degree in the commandments. The loss of a sense of sin that characterizes our error helps Satan act nearly undisturbed and inducing man to sin takes man progressively away from the love of God. Everything is lawful. What is wrong there? Everyone does it. These are suggestions that weaken the consciousness of men and women lead them on the path towards closing hearts, egoism, lack of forgiveness, and doing everything for money, power, and sex. 
everything that seduces and enslaves souls leads to their death, which is Satan's objective. The ordinary temptations of the devil are played mainly in the area of intelligence. Let us think of the many theoretical errors that are passed off as modern ideas in order to hinge the principles of the faith as in all the new lifestyles that are contrary to morality, not to speak of corruption, wars, egoism, and all this innumerable forms. The list is truly long. What is the cause of this moral decline? First, we believe that the men of the Christian cause to struggle against the powers of darkness, where St. Paul who warned us, for we are not contending against the flesh and blood, but against the principalities, against the powers, against the royal rules of the present darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness and heavenly realms, and this is Ephesians 6.12. Here's how the Vatican II frames the situation. With the orders of values of jumble, the bad is mixed with the good. Individuals and group pay heed slowly to their own interests and not to those of others. Thus it happens that the world ceases to be a place of true brotherhood. In our own day, the magnified power of humanity threatens to destroy the race itself. For the mind and struggle against the powers of darkness for the whole history of man, the battle is joined through the very origin of the world and will continue to last day as the Lord has attested. Caught in this conflict, man is obligated to wrestle constantly clinging to what is good, nor can he achieve his own integrity without great efforts and the help of God's grace. And this is the reality that we live in. Again, your culture will teach you many, many things and many terrible things at that. So the fixed belief systems that you're superior to others in one type of way that those who do not... Uh, follow your culture, for example, are inferior in some type of way. Again, the bad is mixed with the good. And this is the cause of the moral decline. When people open themselves up to the lack of love, when people start loving themselves, loving others, specifically, again, when people stop loving others and believe they do not have to love others, this is the spiritual corruption. This is spiritual enthrallment. Because that is open rebellion against God. Again, sin is a defined of harming others. So Romans chapter 13, verse 10. So again, the harming of others. And I might as well actually just pick up my Bible and read that. So Romans first, chapter 13, verse 10. So A through 10. So owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves one another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not bear false witness, you should not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Again. So love does no harm to your neighbor. So love, love does no harm to others. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Or again, God is love. Those who are not of love are not of God. And it's 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, specifically. Imagine this day. God took the form of us humans. God is every human that you meet. And I'm actually repeating what I preached about in my January 8th sermon, which of course I'll link below in my actual uh, upload of the sermon on YouTube and Facebook. So I'm again, on how to be a Christian in 2024 with that sermon. So continuing on the topic in hand, what is the limitation that Jesus has placed on each of us? And I'm actually going to, so. Huh. 
Okay, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's uh, Class Exploration of Christian Community, so pages 30 through 37. Christian community is like the Christian sanctification. It is a gift from God which we cannot claim. Only God knows the real state of our fellowship with our sanctification. What may not appear, we can trifling us may be great and glorious to God. Just as a Christian should not constantly feel his spiritual pulse, so too the Christian community is not to be given to us by God for us to be constantly taking its temperature. The more thankfully we daily receive what is given to us, the more surely and steadily will fellowship increase and grow from day to day as God pleases. Christian brotherhood is not an idea which must be realized. It is rather the reality created by God in Christ to which we participate. The more clearly we learn to recognize that the ground and strength and promise of all our fellowship is in Christ Jesus alone, the more serenely shall we think of our fellowship and pray and hope for it. Because Christian community is founded solely on Jesus Christ, it is a spiritual, not a psychic reality. In this, it differs absolutely from all other communities. The scripture calls it mnemonic, spiritual, that which is created only by the Holy Spirit, who puts Jesus Christ into our hearts as Lord and Savior. The scripture's term, psychic human, that which comes from the natural orders, powers, the capacities of the human spirit. The basis of all spirituality is the clear and manifest word of God in Jesus Christ. The basis of all human reality is the dark, turbid urges and desires of the human mind. And this is again the reality, our human nature is intrinsically evil. And without the Holy Spirit, we cannot overcome our human nature. Without the Holy Spirit that God gives us, we cannot overcome evil. So again, as I stated in my last sermon, those who do not exemplify the fruits of the Spirit and embody the, the fruits of the Spirit in their daily life. So Galatians chapter 5, so love, joy, peace, patience, guidance, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who do not exemplify the fruits of the Holy Spirit in their daily lives do not have the Holy Spirit in them, and this I affirm as a legally ordained reverend. And again, I use this as a tool set in my when it comes to doing exorcism, for that matter, the spiritual path that I've been given, that spiritual correction. Again, if you do not exemplify the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your daily life, you do not have the Holy Spirit residing in you. The main reason why I teach on repentance is because every single person can be changed through God's Holy Spirit, through God's Word to strengthen you, through prayer, through the sacraments, and through the Eucharist and everything else. So embodying the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your daily life, the Holy Spirit is in you. And again, you have to maintain the Holy Spirit in you. Hatred is a cancer, is a poison. Hatred is open rebellion against God, but not just that, it is the poison that can and does remove the Holy Spirit in you. And this is again the spiritual corruption, the lack of love for others. When someone begins to not love others, that is the moment when the Holy Spirit is no longer in them. They can perhaps be a Christian as they do, but no matter what they profess, they do not have the Holy Spirit because of hatred. And of course, uh, and 
this, I will state in actuality from uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15, and I'm actually going to go right to that in my Bible. That's the plus side about being a street preacher. Carry this my actual Bible, so when I reference something, I will go actually to that part of Scripture. So again, 1 John 3, Fourteen through fifteen. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. And that's chapter thirteen. So fourteen through fifteen. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. And this is Saint John's statement in no uncertain terms. If you have hatred for others in your hearts, the Holy Spirit is not in you, and you do not have eternal life. So those who are consumed, dominated by hatred, they, specifically, are defined as our enemies. And these are the ones we have to save. This is why you pray for them. This is why you do everything you can to save them. And if they are harming others, you put a stop to it literally, either physically or spiritually, through prayer, or in my case, definitely major exorcism as necessary, as for the reason why I ended up having to do the consecration at my day job, because the day before I was dealing with a certain person who had so much hatred rising inside them, person who demeans others, person and narcissist for that person, but of course, I didn't give that person a warning as I normally typically would, but as the senior exorcist in charge of me knows of this person specifically, and knows their history and what I've related, but specifically that individual in question, in this case I didn't give the warnings I normally would, instead I took out my major exorcism, but did some sacraments and prayed for them for the rest of the day and evening, and the next day of course after I did that consecration, and for that week, for the matter, they were completely empowered. So their ability to harm others was neutral, neutralized. Reality. Because, again, hatred is separation from God, it is spiritual death. And the way you gain spiritual evils, this I get to affirm as an actual system, and I'll get to like my third year, give or take. So I'll stay in no uncertain terms. The way you get obtained spiritual evils is having hatred in your heart for others. Living a life that is contrary to love is how you obtain vexation. Living a life that is rebellion against God. This is how you get under vexation. And of course, stating all this in no uncertain terms, selling your soul. Either for power, for sex, or in the case of idolaters, selling your soul for a single human being like all the idolaters that try to call themselves Christians, those Christian nationalists, for example. They sold their souls and they're under spiritual trauma. They sold their souls and are under vexation. And my own ruling on dealing with them is pray for them, make certain that they get the spiritual help that they need, the mental health help that they desperately need, hold them to legal accountability when they harm others, and the church has necessary of course, there's a reason why there is excommunication. Excommunicate them until they repent and change. The repentance is changed. Once they change, make changes in life, and once they change, that's the point where they are welcome back in. 
That's the point where they are as a body of Christ. And if they do not have the Holy Spirit, A, not going to heaven. B, because they do not have the Holy Spirit, something else gets in them, takes up claim, sets up shop, has residence in them. That entity, that spiritual entity, the demon, that is the thing that I have to target, especially in regards to safeguarding people. So I will say to know in certain terms, the way you obtain spiritual evils is living a life contrary to love. You as a Christian have to save others. Your one mission on this earth, once you become a Christ, is to love others. Loving others is tending to the sick, tending to the wounded, tending to those who are suffering, helping those in need. Every single human is your brother and sister, according to God's promise to Abraham to fulfill the coming of Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, now getting back to what I was talking about. Okay, the base of all spiritual reality is a clear manifest word of God in Jesus Christ. The base of all human reality is a dark, turbid origin of the desires of the human mind. The base of the community of the spirit is the truth. The base of the human community of the spirit is desire. The essence of the community of the spirit is the light, for the God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. And if we speak in light, as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The essence of the human community of spirit is darkness. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Mark chapter 7, verse 21. It is a deep night that hovers over the source of all human action, even over all the noble and devout impulses. The community of the Spirit is a fellowship of those who, call, who are called by Christ. The human community of the Spirit is a fellowship of devout souls. In the community of the Spirit, there burns a bright love, a brotherly service, agape, unconditional love. In human community of spirit, there glows the dark love of good and evil desire, eros. In the former, there is ordered brotherly service, in the latter, disordered desire for pleasure. In the former, humble subjection to the brother, in the latter, humble yet haughty subjection of a brother to one's own desire. In the community of spirit, the word of God alone rules. In human community of spirit, there rules, along with the word, the man who is furnished with exceptional powers, experience, and magical, suggestive capacities. There God's word alone is binding. Here, besides the word, man binds others to themselves. <clears throat> Their all power, honor, and dom dominion are surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Here, spheres of power and influence over personal nature are sought and cultivated. It is true, and so far, that these devout men, that they do this with the intention of serving the highest and the best, but in actuality, the result is to dethrone the Holy Spirit, to relegate him to remain unreality. In actuality, it is only the human that is operative here. In the spiritual realm the spirit governs in human community psychological techniques and methods the former naive unpsychological unmethodical helping love is extended towards one's brother in the latter psychological analysis and construction in the one service of one's brother is simple and humble and the other service consists in searching calculating and analysis of a stranger perhaps the contrast between spiritual and human reality can be made most clear in the following observation Within the spiritual community, there is never, nor in any way, any immediate relationship with one another, whereas human community expresses a profound elemental human desire for community, for immediate contact with other human souls. Just as in the flesh, there is the urge for physical merger of the f with other flesh. Such desire of the human soul seeks a complete fusion of I and thou, where this is to occur in the union of love, or in what is after the same thing, is forcing the other person into one's fear of power and influence. Here is where the humanly strong person is in its element, securing himself the admiration, love, or the fear of the weak. <clears throat> Here human ties, suggestions, and bonds are everything, and in the immediate community of souls, we have reflected the disordered image of everything that is originally and solely peculiar to community mediated through Christ. Thus there is such a thing as human absorption. 
It appears in all the forms of conversion where the superior power of one person is consciously or unconsciously misused to influence profoundly and draw into the spell the other individual or whole community. Here one soul operates directly upon another soul. The weak have been overcome by the strong. The resistance of the weak has been broken down under the influence of another person. He has been overpowered and not won over by the thing itself. This becomes evident as soon as the demand is made that he throw himself into the cause itself independently of the person to whom he is bound or possibly in opposition to this person. Here is where a humanly converted person breaks down and thus makes it evident that his conversion was affected not by the Holy Spirit but by a man and therefore has no stability. Likewise, there is human love to one's neighbor. Such passion is capable of religious sacrifices, often far surpasses genuine Christian love in a fervent devotion and vision and results. It speaks the Christian language with overwhelming and stirring eloquence. But it is what Paul is speaking of when he says, Though thou I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though thou I give my body to be burned. In other words, for thou I combine the utmost deeds of love with the utmost devotion and have no charity, that is, the love of Christ. It profit me nothing. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3. Human love is directed to the other person for his own sake. Spiritual love loves him for Christ's sake. Therefore, human love seeks direct contact with the other person. It loves him not as a free person, but as one who binds itself to itself. It wants to gain to capture by every means. It uses force. It desires to be irresistible to rule. And again, so that domination of others, that control of others. So, again, this is why Christian nationalism, so Trumpism, is not only heretical, it is anti-Christ. Direct opposition to God, because, again, human nature intrinsically evil. It's a desire to pull others to oneself, to rule, to dominate them. They are anti-Christ and have to be not only rebuked, but to be dethroned, in essence. To be stood against to protect their victims from them. So the victims of hatred and wrong. So human love has little regard for truth. It makes the truth relative since nothing, not even the truth, must come between it and the beloved person. Human love desires the other person, his cupping is answering love, but it does not serve him. On the contrary, it continues to desire even when it seems to be serving. There are two marks, both of which one and the same thing, that manifest the difference between spiritual and human love. Human love cannot tolerate the dissolution of a fellowship that has become false for the sake of genuine fellowship. And human love cannot love an enemy, that is, one who is seriously and stubbornly resists it. Both spring from the same source, human love by its nature, desire, desire for human community. So long as it can satisfy the desire in some way, it will not give it up, even for the sake of the truth, or even for the sake of genuine love for others. But where it can no longer accept its desire to be fulfilled, there it stops short, namely, in the face of the enemy. There it turns into hatred, contempt, calumny. Right here is the point where spiritual love begins. This is why human love becomes personal hatred when it encounters genuine spiritual love, which does not desire but serves. Human love makes itself an end to itself. It creates for itself an idol, an end, which it worships. So again, going back to this worship of idols, so hero worship, ancestor worship, these are defined as idolatry, loosely, but theologically defined nevertheless. So hero worship, so Trumpism, Bidenism for that matter, badism in general. That is idolatry. Intrinsically evil. As not of Christ. Antichrist. So again, human love makes itself an end of itself. It creates itself an end, an idol, which it worships, to which it must subject everything. It nurses and cultivates an ideal. It loves itself and nothing else in the world. Spiritual love, however, comes from Jesus Christ. It serves him alone and knows that it has no immediate access to other persons. Jesus Christ stands between the lover and the others he loves. 
I do not know in advance what love of others means on the basis of the general idea of love that grows out of my human desires. All of this may rather be hatred and an insidious kind of selfishness in the eyes of Christ. What love is, only Christ tells us in his word. Contrary to my opinions and my convictions, Jesus Christ will tell me what love towards the brethren really is. Therefore, spiritual love is bound solely to the word of Jesus Christ. Where Christ bids me to maintain fellowship for the sake of love, I will maintain it. Where his truth enjoys me to dissolve that fellowship for love's sake, there I will dissolve it. Decide all the protests of my human love. Because spiritual love does not desire, but rather serves. It loves an enemy as a brother. It originates neither in the brother nor in the enemy, but in Christ and his word. Human love can never understand spiritual love, for spiritual love is from above. It is something completely strange, new, and comprehensible to all earthly love. Because Jesus stands between me and others, I dare not desire direct fellowship with them. It is only Christ can speak to me in such a way that I may be saved, so others too can be saved only by Christ himself. This means that I must release the other person from every attempt of mine to regulate, coerce, and dominate him with my love. The other person needs to retain his independence of me, to be loved for what he is, it is one for whom Christ became man, died, and rose again. For whom Christ bought forgiveness of sin and eternal life. Because Christ has long since acted decisively for my brother, therefore I could be, begin to act. I must leave him in his freedom to be Christ. I must meet him only as a person and he already in Christ's eyes. This is the meaning of the preposition that we can meet others only through the mediation of Christ. Human love constructs its own image of the other person, of what he is and what he should become. It takes the life of the other person in its own hands. Spiritual love recognizes the true image of the other person, which is received from Jesus Christ, the image that Jesus Christ himself embodied, it would step upon all men. Therefore, spiritual love proves itself in that everything it says and does commands Jesus Christ. They will not seek to move others by all too personal direct influence by impure interference in the life of another. It will not take pleasure in pious human fervor and excitement. It would rather meet the other person with the clear word of God and be ready to leave him alone with this word for a long time, willing to release him again in order that Christ may deal with him. It will respect that the line has been drawn between him and us by Christ. It will find full fellowship with him in Christ who alone binds us together. Thus the spiritual love will speak to Christ about a brother more than of a brother about Christ. It knows that the most direct way to others is always through prayer to Christ, and that love of others is wholly dependent upon the truth in Christ. It is out of this love that John the disciple speaks, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. 3 John 4 Human love lives by uncontrollable and uncontrollable dark desires. Spiritual love lives in the clear light of service ordered by the truth. Human love produces human subjugation, dependence, constraint. Spiritual love creates freedom of the brethren under the word of God. Human love reaps hothouse flowers. Spiritual love creates the fruits that grow healthily in accordance with God's good will in the rain, the storm, and sunshine of God's outdoors. The existence of any Christian life together depends on whether it succeeds in the right time in bringing out the ability to distinguish between a human ideal and God's reality, between spiritual in human community. And I'll stop there. And this is from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Life Together, the classic exploration of Christian community. So again, in shortness, the limitation Jesus has placed on us is the other person. And then I'm going to take a reading from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship. On this. So, from Dietrich Bonhoeffer's Cost of Discipleship, Chapter 18, The Disciple and Unbelievers. Judge not that ye not be judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured unto you. And what beholdest thou, the mote that is thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me cast out the mote in thine eye, and lo, the beam is thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, cast out first the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote in thy brother's eye. 
Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither shall you shall you cast pearls before swine, lest happily the trap of and feed and torn and render you. Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that acteth receiveth, that he that seeketh findeth, and him that knocketh it shall be opened. For what man is there of you, whom in his son shall ask him a love, will give him a stone? Or shall ask a fish, or give him a serpent? But if ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask of him? All things therefore ye, whatever ye should do, that men should do unto you, even so do ye also unto them. For that is the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 7 verses 1 through 12. The frontier between the old life and the new was clearly drawn, but this raises the question of the relationship between the Christians and their non-Christian neighbors. Does their separation from the rest of society confer on them special rights and privileges? Do Christians enjoy powers, gifts, and standards of judgment which qualify them to exert a peculiar authority over others? How easily it would have been for the disciples to adopt a superior attitude to pass unqualified condemnation on the rest of the world and he persuaded himself that this was the will of God. That is why Jesus had to make it clear beyond all doubt that such misunderstanding would seriously impair their discipleship. The disciples are not to judge. If so, they do so. They themselves will be judged by God. The sword there and they judge their brother will fall upon their own heads. Instead of cutting themselves off from their brother, as a just for you and just, they will find themselves cut off from Jesus. <clears throat> he possesses his righteousness only with that association, never outside of it. This is why his righteousness can never become an object criterion to be applied at will. He is a disciple not because he possesses such a new standard, but only because of Jesus Christ's mediator and very son of God. That is to say, his righteousness is hidden from himself in his fellowship with Jesus. He cannot, as he could once, be detached, observer himself, and judge himself, for he can only see Jesus and be seen by him, judged by him, and free by him. It is not an approved standard of righteous living that separates a follower of Christ from an unbeliever, but it is Christ who stands between them. Christians are the other man as brother to whom Jesus Christ comes. They meet them only by going to them with other as free men, directly exchange their views and judging one another by objective criteria. And again, who Christ comes, they meet them only by going to them with Jesus. Disciple and non-disciple can never encounter each other as free men, directly exchanging their views and judging one another by their object criteria. No disciple can meet the non-disciple only as a man to whom Jesus comes. Here alone, Christ fight for the soul of the unbeliever. His call, his love, his grace, and his judgment come into its own. Discipleship does not afford us a point of vantage from which to attack others. We come to them with an unconditional offer of fellowship, the single-mindedness of the love of Jesus. When we judge other people, we confront them in the spirit of detachment, observing and reflecting as it were from the outside. But love has neither time nor opportunity for this. If we love, we can never observe the other person again for that detachment, for he is always at every moment a living flame or a love and service. But does not the evil the other person make we condemn him just for his own good, for the sake of love? Here we see the depth of the divine ding line. Any misguided love for the sinner is ominous close to the love of sin, but the love of Christ for the sinner in itself is a condemnation of sin, as his expression of extreme hatred of sin. The disciples of Christ are to love unconditionally. And again, the most important point, we have to love unconditionally. Our first, our one and only mission upon this earth as children of God. Our one mission is to love others. Once we become a Christ, there is no other mission. That is our one mission, to love others. So the disciples of Christ are to love unconditionally. Thus they may affect what their own undivided and usually and conditionally offered love neither could achieve, namely the radical condemnation of sin. 
If the disciples make judgments of them, they set them standards of good and evil. But Jesus Christ is not a standard which I can apply to others. He is judging myself, revealing my own virtues to me as something altogether evil. Thus I am not permitted to apply to the other person what does not apply to me. For in my judgment according to good and evil, I only affirm the other person's evil, for he does exactly the same. For he does not know the hidden equity of the good, but seeks his justification in it. If I condemn his evil actions, I thereby confirm in him his apparently good actions, which are not yet never the good con commended by Christ. Thus we remove him from the judgment of Christ and subject to human judgment. But I bring God's judgment upon my own head, for I then do not live any more on and out of the grace of Jesus Christ, but out of my own knowledge of good and evil which I hold on to you. To every one God is the kind of God he believes in. Judgment is a forbidden objectivization of the other person, which destroys single mind love. I am not forbidden to have my own thoughts about the other person who realizes shortcomings, but only the extent that it offers me an occasion of forgiveness and unconditional love, as Jesus pr proves to me. If I withhold my judgment, I am not indulging in to comprehend it, to put in air, and confirm the other person in his bad ways. Neither am I nor the other person, but God is always right and shall proclaim both his grace and judgment. Judging others makes us blind, whereas love is illuminating. By judging others, we blind ourselves to our own evil and to the grace that which others are just as tall to as we are. But in the love of Christ, we know all about everything is evil of sin and guilt, for we know how Jesus suffered and how all men have been forgiven at the foot of the cross. Christian love sees a fellow man under the cross and thereby sees with clarity. If we then judge others, our real motive is to destroy evil. We should look for evil where it is certain to be found, and that is in our own hearts. But if we are to look out for evil in the others, our real motive is obviously to justify ourselves. If we are seeking to escape the punishment for our own sins by passing judgment on others, and are assuming by implication that the word of God applies to ourselves in one way and the others in the another. All this is highly dangerous and is leading. We are trying to claim for ourselves a special privilege which we deny to others. The cross disciples have no right of their own or stand of right and wrong which they can enforce with other people. They have received nothing but Christ's fellowship. Therefore, the disciple is not to sit out judgment over his fellow man because he would wrong usurp the jurisdiction. <clears throat> But the Christian is not only forbidden to judge other men, even the word of salvation has its limits. He has neither the power nor right to force on other men its season out of season. Every attempt to impose the gospel of force to run after people to proselyze them, to use their own resources to raise the salvation of other people, is both futile and dangerous. It's futile because the swine do not recognize the pearls that are cast before them, dangerous because it refrains the word of forgiveness by causing others we fain would serve to sin against that which is holy. Worse still, we shall be met with the blinding rage of hardened hearts and darkened hearts, and that will be useless and harmful. Our easy trafficking with the reward of free grace triply bores the world to disgust. The cheap grace, of course, is the forgiveness of sin. Without the redemption of the person. So the forgiveness of the sin without the person changing. So the forgiveness of sin without the church discipline, again, cheap grace is damnation. So the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, and communion without confession. Cheap grace is another word for damnation. And of course, I'm paraphrasing Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but this is a definition of cheap grace. Cheap grace is the forgiveness without Jesus Christ. This is why, when it comes to being a priest, I do not give uh, out uh, blind dispensations. I am not the priest you go to you for confession. I've been given a church discipline path, which means I use exorcism. I go right at the heart of the matter, and I go right after the demonic, especially in the other. Or what specifically gives that person that compulsion to harm others and worse. So again, I am not the priest that you go to you for confession. I'm the one who does spiritual correction. I'm the one who does the church discipline. And of course, as an exorcist, I battle the demonic. Especially in the safeguarding human souls, 
the safeguarding the human lives, the safeguard of the human lives around me. <clears throat> so thus, a strict limit is placed upon the activity of the disciples, just as Matthew chapter 10, they are told to shake the dust of their feet with the word of peace to refuse the healing, their restless energy, which refuses to recognize any limit to their activity, the zeal, which refuses to take note of resistance. Straits are confusion in the gospel of the victorious ideology. An ideology requires fanatics who neither know nor notice opposition is certainly put in force, but the word of God in its weakness takes the risk of meeting the score of the man and being rejected. There are hearts which are hardened and doors which are close to the word. The word recognizes opposition when it meets it and is prepared to suffer it. It's a hard lesson, but a true one, that the gospel, unlike an ideology, reckons with impossibilities. The word is weaker than any ideology, and this means that only with the gospel at their command, the witnesses are weaker than the propagandists of an opinion. But although they are weak, they are ready to suffer with the word and are so free from the moral restlessness which is so characteristic of fanaticism. The disciples can even yield their ground and run away, provided they do so with the word, provided their weakness is the weakness of the word, and provided they do not leave the word and enlarge in their flight. They are simply the servants and instruments of the word. They have no wish to be strong where the word chooses to be weak. To try and force the word on the world by hook or by crook is to make the living word of God into a mere idea, and the world which is perfectly justified in refusing to listen to an idea for which has no use. At other times, the disciples of six of their guns refuse to run away, though of course only when the word so wills. If they do not realize this weakness of the word, they have failed to perceive the mystery of the divine humility. The same weak word which is content to endure the gainsaying of the sinners is also the mighty word of mercy which can convert the hearts of sinners. Its strength is veiled in weakness. If it came in power, that would mean that the day of tribulation had already arrived. The great task of the disciples is to recognize the limits of their commission. But if they use a word amiss, it will certainly turn against them. And this is the point against Christ Christian nationalities, these fanatics, these zealots, like Zionists, for example, in Israel, and about why that war is so genocidal. They believe they're superior. They believe that they are given command to dominate, control, and to kill in God's name. And to do all of this, and God, of course, will never ask you to kill in his name. Demon will. Spirit of murder, at least that type of demonic spirit. And that is the point. Again, that is the point. There is a limitation placed on us Christians <clears throat> where we can only proselytize as long as we live the word of God. Only through the Holy Spirit. So if you proselytize, chase others with Bibles, but do not live the word of God, again, as previously stated, if you do not have love for others, the Holy Spirit is not in you. You are not of the Holy Spirit. You are up in rebellion against God. You are an Antichrist. And this is the realization. So many fallen Christians here in America, like 70%, are fallen because of their hatred of others and their belief that they can dominate and control others. And believe that God justifies their hatred. And they are one foot in hell already, and so many spiritual evils. And they are under spiritual enthronement because the blind do not realize where they are going, and it's the blind leading the blind, and both are going into the pits, so both right to hell. And this is the thing about looking at the political situation here with idolaters, especially, because they are all Gehenna bound, because they sold their soul for a single human being. And we as Christians have to pray for them. We as Christians have to save them from themselves and save them from what is inside them. That diabolical obsession. And yes, that specific type of possession, which all idolaters suffer. And this is why I have great compassion on Trump supporters. And great compassion on anyone who would sell their soul for a human being. Are they my enemies? Absolutely. 
Anyone who fails the Majesty is my enemy, by default. Anyone in open rebellion, anyone who is under spiritual enthrallment, under the power of the ruler of this world, is a Christian's enemy, and therefore my enemy, by default. And the only way to confront evils of this world and confront your enemies is to love them, is to pray for them, is to heal them of their ailments, their afflictions, is to give them unconditional love, the love that God gives you, you are to give to others. Again, this is your one mission. Love others, heal others, help others, safeguard others. This is what it means to be a Christian. This is what it means to be a Christian in 2024. Okay, so... So, what are the disciples to do when they encounter opposition and cannot pr penetrate the hearts of men? They must admit that no circumstances do they possess any rights or powers over others and that they have no direct access to them. The only way to reach others through him in whose hands they are themselves like all other men. The disciples are taught to pray, and so they have and so they learn that the only way to reach others is by praying to God. Judgment and forgiveness are always in the hands of God. He closes and he opens. But the disciples must ask, they must seek and knock, and then God will hear them. They have to learn that their anxiety and concern for others must drive them to intercession. The promise Christ gives to their prayer is a joyous weapon of their armory. This is the reality. Prayer is extremely powerful. God will answer according to what is in your hearts. The main reason why I've been given this church discipline path, why I've been given the exorcist route, is to save others from what's been consumed and dominating them. To safeguard the lives and the souls of my community that I've been assigned. Safeguard every single human. Again, this is why I have to rely on God's Holy Spirit. This is why I have to embody God's Holy Spirit. You, as a Christian, have to do all of this and more, whether you are clergy, like me, or not. You have to safeguard others, you have to save others, you have to work through salvation, through prayer, above all else. Again, Disciples must ask, they must seek and knock, and then God will hear them. They have to learn that their anxiety and concern for others must drive them to intercession. The promise Christ gives to their prayer is the joyous weapon in their armory. The difference between disciples seeking... Okay, so... So how can you look for something and find it if you do not know what you're looking for? The disciples seek a God whom they have found in the promise they have received from Jesus. To sum up, is it clear from the foregoing that a disciple has no special privilege or power of his own in all his intercourse with others. The mainspring of his life and work is the strength which comes from fellowship with Jesus Christ. Jesus offers his disciples a simple rule of thumb which will enable even the least sophisticated them to tell whether his intercourse with others is on the right lines or not. All they need to do is say, I instead of thou, and to put himself in the other man's place. Also, all things whatsoever you men that do unto you, even so do ye also unto them. For this is the law and the prophets. The moment he does that, the disciple forfeits all advantage over all other men, and can no longer excuse himself what he condemns in others. He is as strict in condemning evil in self as he was before with others, and as lenient with the evil in others as he was before himself. The evil in the other person is the same exact evil as in ourselves. There is only one law, one judgment, and one grace. Henceforth, the disciple must look upon other men as forgiven sinners, with whom their lives, own their lives to the love, and know their own lives to the love of God. This is the law and the prophets. For this is none other than the supreme commandment to love God above all things and our neighbors as ourselves. So, before I close, I'm going to do one more reading. So again, so why does God permit evil? 
We've spoken, and this is going to be reading from Gal Father Gabriel Almas and Exodus explains the Yamanic, the Ancestorian's army of fallen angels. We have spoken evil spells, possession, vexation, and possession, and infestation. Now the question arises, why does God permit evil? First, it is necessary to make clear that God, being infinite love, does not wish evil. He simply permits it because he created men and angels as free creatures. Simply put, men are free to choose whether they wish to live for God or against him, and therefore to opt for heaven or for hell. We must recognize that God has made everything to make man happy, and in accordance with his plan, God asks man to obey the laws that he has established, but God has also given man the ability to refuse this truth. This is the situation in which we are placed. The first who had to choose, as we said, were the angels, with whom case the demons chose to tempt men or attract men to themselves. The second, in the mention of time is man, and so it falls on each of us angels to make a choice. John's Gospel says of Christ, All things were made through him, without him nothing was made that was made. John chapter 1, verse 3. Could God have given to creation a greater goal than himself than the possibility of enjoying the vision, the cause of eternal joy? We, in fact, live for him, and there could be no more marvelous goal. Therefore, the rebellion of the angels and excessive disobedience of men tells us that evil is a concrete possibility and that God has permitted in order to make us free. And here we are before the great mystery that creatures freely choose evil rather than good. This is the greatest risk that God has taken of the creatures, angels, and men, and he has taken for the simple reason because without free will, that is, without the possibility of choosing between good and bad, we would be robots and not totally free creatures. Liberty, infinite in God, is a sign of our greatness and our sonship in Jesus Christ. Without it, we could not call ourselves sons, but it only saves. God has given us everything. We must recognize him, adore only him, be guided by only him, because inevitably, we do not give to God, we necessarily give to idols. He who is not with me is gives me. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Half measures do not exist. Either we are of Christ or we are of Satan. At times, we like to go halfway serving Christ part well. That's not possible. The devious method that the devil used with Adam and Eve also works with us. It leads us to think that evil and sin do not exist, that to sin, distancing ourselves from God, trying to sing for a pleasure back experiences again. So in the end, what evil is there? So again, as just stated previously, half measures do not exist for the Christian. Either we are of Christ, which is love and peace, or we are of Satan, hatred, and everything else that is Antichrist. You cannot have devotion to anything other than God. And this is doubly true considering the immediate consequence of that devotion to God and something is the selling of your soul directly, as these idolaters, Trump supporters, have done. Or Biden supporters, for that matter. Same difference. Selling your soul for a single individual and then becoming obsessed with them, living for them, being ready to die for them, and killing in their name. And trying to dominate and control those who their Messiah wishes for them to dominate control. We saw this with the rise of Nazis and and Hitler, and we saw and we're seeing this with Trump and his supporters time and again. It is the same evil, the ancient evil, the ancient enemy of Yahweh, Satan. They are Antichrist, and they have to be opposed with compassion. They have to be opposed with love legal accountability, prayer, and especially exorcism to get rid of that diabolical obsession. And yes, that is the type of possession that they are under vexation of. Because they sold their souls for a single human being. And this is the reality of 2024 for you as a Christian. You have to safeguard others from what's inside of them. You have to protect the victims of the accumulated contempt, the victims of hatred and wrong. You have to safeguard the victims of hatred and wrong. You have to safeguard your fellow human beings, safeguard your brothers and sisters from those who would kill them. You have to safeguard them from those who would try to dominate them. You have to safeguard others from those who are under Lucifer's enthrallment. The, the spirit of 
anger, spirit of hatred, spirit of murder, the top's the demonic suggestion that in the demonic suggestion to harm and kill others. This is a spiritual reality you live in year 2024. So, anyways, let us pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I come before you today. I come for you with a request that burns my heart. Father God, I pray right now with the, with the world right now that you continue to involve yourself in the Ukraine war and that especially in the Israel-Gaza war that you do not let the genocide to continue. That you do directly interfere and bring the world, if necessary, against the state of Israel. We believe they can do all that they wish to those that they despise, to do all that they wish against their enemy. If they do not follow your word, they do not follow your ways, they do not love their enemies, and they therefore are under the power of the ruler of this world. And this is why the genocide, the death spells, the, the fixed belief system that they are superior to their enemies and those around them, and that they can dominate and control. And they saw this for so many years, by the way, of course, as a certified human rights consultant. And I teach previously in my past sermons on what human rights Israel has violated and has continued to violate in this war, Father God. I pray, Father God, that you interfere the directly. You interfere. Do not allow the atrocities to continue. And I have these conflicts, Father God, that you safeguard everyone, Father God, especially in my community, that those whose hearts are stifled with hatred, Father God, that those who are dominated by the spirit of hatred, Father God, and anger in my community, that the spirit of murder, that you neutralize the entities that have possessed them, Father God, that you neutralize, that you disable, that you depower them in my community, especially the idolaters as necessary, especially when it comes down to later in this year, when they will be given to that compulsive desire to harm and kill others and murder others, as is the case in the definition of diabolical obsession, that you, Father God, that you neutralize the entity that gives power to those thoughts, that compulsion, Father God, that you safeguard the lives around you, Father God, these humans, these children of yours, Father God, that you safeguard, that you protect them, Father God, you protect my community, Father God, and that you protect, of course, my country, Father God, and you protect this world, Father God. In your name I pray this. And that you give peace to those who need peace, love to those who need love, healing to those who need, need healing, especially, Father God. In this I pray, amen. Anyways, everyone, stay safe, and God bless.